feel like I look so angelic today wearing the white with my milk. I've also got this really annoying song stuck in the back of my head. It's club. Ain't no party like in this club party. It's club seven. If you know, you know. Don't look at me that way. You love them too. Hey there guys, my name is Megan if you're new here and if not, welcome back for episode 30 of Killer Weekend where each week we'll discuss a true crime case and you guys can feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments box below. Like that body roll there, little Tay Swift body roll. If you like all things true crime, supernatural, UFO, conspiracy theory and all that good stuff in between then please hit that subscribe button. I'll be here for you every Friday with our true crime Killer Weekend and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our Weirdo Wednesdays where we'll discuss something scary I've heard. I will leave a small disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. There is construction work currently going on next door so if you hear a lot of loud banging or men screaming it's because I've went next door and murdered them. They've been working from 8am to 8pm for one whole week. On a serious note, this case does involve details of a missing child. If that's a trigger point for you, then please do turn away now. So my wee angels, what have y'all been up to? You been having a good time? I almost died of a three day hangover. And I'm not being dramatic, but I feel like on day two, I saw Jesus. I thought it was the end for me, but I pulled through. Only God can judge me. So guys, this week's case is something that's a wee bit different for me. You all know if you've been to my channel before that I love to do a good old dolphin nose dive into my cases. I like to get right into the meat and potatoes and find out every bit of information I can. I've spoken about this several evenings spent on Reddit. You read a lot of stuff, seen a lot of things. But for some reason, in some cases, you don't get that much information. This is actually a case I saw on an old YouTube video and I actually screenshotted it on my phone so that I wouldn't forget. And for some weird reason, my phone deleted the screenshot. That was fun. Aren't you glad you tuned in today? We've got dogs barking, hammers going. It's fun, regular circus. But anywho, like I've seen, there's certain cases that you simply can't forget because the media doesn't let you. I mean, I'm sure we all know about the case of Madeleine McCann, a young girl who was taken from her parents in Portugal. We also hear about the story of Jean Benet Ramsey, a young girl murdered in her own home. And this is because these young girls have constantly appeared on our TV screens. But there are some people who aren't as lucky who don't receive this kind of coverage. And not coincidentally at all, a lot of these missing children are young black females. Now, I'm never gonna be naive and sit here and say that has nothing to do with class or race because we all know that it does somewhere. And I feel like we as creators have a responsibility to these missing children to speak for them when no one else will listen. And that being said, in tonight's episode, we will be discussing the mysterious disappearance of Myra Lewis. Myra Lewis was born on November 30th, 2011. She was a wee Sagittarius, the best of the zodiacs, I would say. I'm not a Sagittarius, I'm a Capricorn. We're horrible people. Myra was born in Camden, Mississippi to her mother, Erica, and her father, Greg. Now, there's not a lot of information on this, like I said, but her mother and father were said to have either three or four additional children. I know that Myra did have a younger sibling who was only one month old when Myra was two. So a lot of babies, they love their babies. Or did they? When Erica was a young girl, she fell in love with impressive Memphis University graduate, Greg Lewis. He was a star athlete, he had an impressive degree in criminal justice, and he was everything that she'd hoped to find as a woman. She wanted someone who could provide her with a stable life so that she could be a dedicated mother and homemaker. After being married, the young couple decided to move into a rural home in Camden, Mississippi. They actually only lived a short ways away from Greg's father. They only lived 176 yards away from his property, and the two homes were separated by his heavy trees and brush. Because Greg was a sole provider and worked several long hours, this meant that Erica was constantly at home alone with the children and she felt lonely sometimes so she would pop down to Greg's dad's house and he would get to see the grandchildren and she would get some adult company. Win-win. The young family's life seemed kind of 
picture perfect but they did have their own set of issues. They had a lot of financial issues which actually led to Erica being charged with welfare fraud for trying to fraudulently claim food stamps for a food bank. Now I mean, I'm just gonna say it. No woman should ever be struggling to feed her children. I think there's definitely a little flaw in the system. But Erica was charged with this and allegedly she kept the whole thing stum from her husband. Erica found herself in even more debt when she was unable to pay the court charges. So there's a lot of secrets in this family, a lot of whispers behind closed doors and Greg doesn't know too much about what's going on. He's working all these long hours, Erica doesn't want to bother him and he is none the wiser. Greg continues to work full time as Erica stays at home with the children and they even give birth to another child after Myra is born. Now I don't agree with that, I think if you're struggling to pay for the three, why have a fourth? It's not very responsible but then when the moment takes you, the moment takes you. So just always make sure you wear protection children. On a cool day on the 1st of March 2014, young Myra, then two years of age, was playing outside in the front garden of the family's home with her sister. This was a gated garden, so therefore it was completely fenced off with a gate at the end, which the kids would then have to go out another gate to get onto the little patch of road. Myra's dark hair was twisted and braided into her usual signature style of bobbles and barrettes. She loved bright colours. In keeping with her bright colourful theme for the day. She was also wearing a turquoise jumper with some bears on it and a pair of pink trainers. Actual question though, I'm just gonna slide that in there. When does it become unacceptable to wear animal motifs on tops? Like per se, if someone wanted to wear a jumper with some dogs or cats on it at the age of a little bit older, would that be acceptable behaviour? I'm just asking for a friend, a very, very fun friend. On that day, sometime between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m., Erica decided that she needed to get a couple of things from the store. They had a new baby who was only a month old at this time, and yeah, she was a wee bit frazzled. She needed to get out of the house. So she decided to take a little trip to the local shops. She walked past the girls playing in the yard and told them that because she was leaving and wasn't there to watch them, that they were to go into the house and see Greg and Greg would fix their breakfast. However, Erica would not stay to make sure that the two girls went back into the house and left her two-year-old daughter and older sibling out playing alone. Greg Lewis then claimed that his older daughter came inside the house and stated that Erica had taken Myra away on her shopping trip with her and they'd be back later that day. Over four hours then passed in which neither Greg or Erica knew where their two-year-old toddler was. Greg thought she was with her mum and Erica thought she was with her dad. The two said that they did not communicate the entire day until Erica arrived home at 3 p.m. that afternoon. She was asking where Myra was and it was kind of like a, is she with you? I thought she was with you, was she with me? No one knew where the two-year-old had gone. Whilst Erica stayed at home with the children, Greg went out on his ATV and brought along the two family dogs. He thought for some reason if he gave them something of Myra's, they would be able to sniff her out but he does do an extensive search of the area and he cannot find his two-year-old baby girl. When he realises he's out of his depth here the family then do call 911 and report their toddler is missing. So to begin with actually the police in Camden did quite a good job. Now calm down I know we're all probably dying of shock because that is so rare but they did do quite a good job in this case. They started by informing other neighbouring police departments because their resources were so small for such a small town that they knew they were a wee bit out of their depth and they needed a hand. They also contacted the FBI and involved the FBI canine units to go out and search for baby Myra. However, no one seemed to find anything. They searched all around the wooded area of the home. They searched a pond that was just on the other side of the two gates at the family's house. They searched the entire home 
and no one could find a trace of Myra. Police were searching well into the night and with no trace of Myra, their concerns started to grow. Obviously, this is out in the middle of nowhere. The weather started to drop, so the temperature was quite cold. And then we have wildlife, you know, could an animal have gotten her during the night? She's a young little two-year-old toddler. Anything could have easily just grabbed her and stolen her away. But after hours and hours of searching, police found nothing. Well, nothing useful. The day after Myra's disappearance, police actually did place out an amber alert for the missing toddler for everyone in the Mississippi area and surrounding areas to be on the lookout for her. They put up her picture, her full description and how much she weighed and what her height was. There was a couple of sightings around Memphis and I know you're probably, you know, alarm bells are ringing. You're like, hasn't she said Memphis before? Yes, Myra's father, Greg Lewis, was a student at the University of Memphis. Do with that, what you want. Three people called in to the tip line to say that they had seen Myra at the Discovery Inn on 3rd Street in Memphis. These were actually quite credible sources because one was a nursery teacher who's around different children every single day and she said she definitely saw Myra in the car park of the inn. Another witness who actually worked in the Discovery Inn said that Myra had been left in the hotel room alone while this gentleman who'd come in with her left her to go run an errand by himself. He ran away to the store across the street and then came back but he left the toddler on her own. Was this just you know a father maybe making the wrong choices in life or could this have been a kidnapped Myra? Police followed up on this lead quite promptly and when they arrived on the scene in Memphis they soon realised that the young girl was not Myra. It's not expressed how they ruled this out, but it was stated in several publications that they had made a statement that it wasn't who they were looking for. Just over a week after Myra's disappearance, as leads kind of dried up, the police would then make an infuriating and very controversial decision. When they were searching the Lewis's home, police found several shotguns and hunting rifles. Now I can see y'all, you're all doing the maths in your head there, but Greg Lewis was a self-professed hunter. He and his father had gone hunting for years and it's something he'd been doing since he was a child. He did however make his own ammunition. Now I'm not saying that's not a life skill to have but just along with a criminal justice degree, a wee bit weird. I mean I can't even make cheese on toast and he's off making his own buckshot. But this wasn't a good enough explanation to police because, you see, Erica Lewis had another little secret. Jesus, this is like an episode of Pretty Little Liars. She actually had a felony charge separate from her welfare fraud charge, which meant that she wasn't allowed to reside in a home which contained firearms. Because this was a breach of her parole agreement, she was then arrested only two weeks after her daughter went missing. If you're thinking what I'm thinking, that that's awful and how could they have done this to her when her daughter was literally missing for like 10 seconds? Things are about to get a wee bit worse so let's just strap on our seatbelt and buckle up. Not only was she taken into custody for these charges but upon searching their home police deemed it as condemned and unlivable conditions and took the couple's other children out of the home and into social care. And this only fueled the mistrust that the family had with law enforcement. I mean I've heard it on say several podcasts discussing similar cases. This is why African Americans don't call the police. They didn't understand the repercussions of their actions because when Erica was put in jail, several members of the public just started to believe that this was maybe placeholder charges until they could catch Erica on the murder charge for her child. And the fact that Erica was put in jail so close to her child going missing, everyone just assumed case closed, the mother did it, and we don't need to keep looking for this child possibly setting this investigation back so much further. 11 weeks after her arrest, Erica was released back to her family and quite promptly the family ceased all contact with Camden Police Department and the FBI agents. The Lewis family then promptly, much like Myra, disappeared into thin air, abandoning their family home and leaving behind little Myra. The Camden Police and FBI state that the family never called to check up on progress of this case and that they no longer can contact them because they never left a forwarding address, email address, phone number, nothing. 
They can't speak to the family even if they wanted to. Now guys, we're gonna get into the theories because there's three kind of main theories and we'll talk through them all and you guys can let me know what you think happened to little Myra. I've got my own ideas, which as always, I will express at the end of this video, but I want it to remain as unbiased as possible until then. So we're gonna have a wee bit of milk and cookies. I'll try and not get crumbs all over my face like I did last week, cause that was bloody embarrassing. So our first kind of idea that people have mentioned is wild animals. Now I can see your eye rolls from way back here but just hear me out because we're talking about Mississippi and according to Google and national treasure David Attenborough we are talking about alligators, coyotes and also bobcats in certain places. Is it possible that Myra had perhaps toddled her way along to the forest and something vicious had got hold of her? I mean it is possible but let's remember there was no blood. There was no scent trace, there was also no clothing of Myra's found in the woods, the family had fencing on the yard and a gate. Is it possible that a two year old little girl could have opened two gates and just wandered off? When she saw her sister going in the house alone, wouldn't she have ran in after her sister? Police have suggested that this is a very unlikely cause of death but we may never know. We then have the theory of a kidnapper or an abductor perhaps to place Myra into human trafficking. This is why she was seen at that Memphis hotel but police have stated that they don't think that was Myra but they've not really said why they don't think it was Myra so we don't really know what ruled that out for police. Did they find the missing man with a little girl in the hotel room? Did he come forward? Some people believe that a stranger, a drifter passing through town or perhaps someone Myra knew walked by the house and saw Myra sitting plain alone and thought hmm I'm gonna take this opportunity. I'm gonna snatch her. But my kind of problem with this is that, like I said, the house was very rural. It was out on a country road. Would anyone have been passing through there? Probably not, unless you were visiting one of the homes on the road. Also, it's kind of off the beaten track. So like I said, unless you were looking for something specifically, would anyone have really been in the area? Another thing to remember, if you've ever visited the middle of the woods, it's deathly quiet, like sometimes a little too quiet. Did Greg hear nothing? Why didn't he hear a car? For example, if someone was driving past in a car and saw their opportunity and grabbed Myra, hence the reason Myra's scent ended at the gate when the police dogs were sniffing her out, is that possible that someone just threw her in a car but her father never heard any sort of engine or any sort of screaming coming from Myra? I know I have a little two year old nephew and if anyone random tried to grab him he would be screaming his lungs out. But to play devil's advocate, Greg and Erica had just had a little one month old baby Baby. Is it possible Greg didn't even hear anything going on outside because the baby was in distress at that time? We just don't know. Please have had several tips about Myra being within a three hour drive of Mississippi but every lead has turned up with nothing. From day one the cloud of suspicion was over Erica and Greg Lewis and I can see why you know there's certain things that when I heard about this case I was like oh red flag, a wee red flag. Oh there's another one, little red flag there. Such as why didn't Erica take the kids inside. Would you really leave your two toddler daughters playing in the garden and not make sure that when you say go in, I'm not here to watch you anymore, go in to see your dad, would you not take them in by the hand? A lot of people do argue against this. Would you really leave them outside unsupervised without stating to your partner I'm going somewhere? take the kids inside. Why when the eldest daughter came into the house did she say that Myra had gone to the store with her mother? Would kids lie about that? I don't know. Kids lie about a lot of weird stuff to be fair. Also coming from a cool auntie's POV, that means point of view. I know that there's not a day that goes by without my sister and her husband communicating about their children. So is it a wee bit strange between the hours of 10am and 3pm that Erica spoke not a word to her husband whilst he was watching all of their children? Another thing that a lot of people question is the fact that the family waited a full hour before calling local police. Now. Can you blame them after the way they were treated? This seems to be a massive issue within the African American community. They don't trust law enforcement and you can't blame them with everything that we've been seeing over the last two years. These people have been living that 
for their whole lives. So I can totally understand them thinking, right, we'll have a look for her around our grounds, make sure she's not here first before jumping to the next conclusion. Also, it was probably a bit of denial on the family's part. They didn't want to believe that Myra was gone forever. We do still have that mysterious felony charge just hanging over us like a bad smell. What was it that Erica was arrested for in her past? Why wasn't she allowed to be in a home with firearms? And also, was the home as condemned as police said it was? Was it in an unlivable condition for those children? We don't know, because we weren't on the inside of the house, so we can't judge. The main thing for me that stands out about the parents is the lack of trying. I get it, they don't want to talk to the police, that's understandable, neither would I because they sound horrific, but they don't publicise that Myra has went missing at all. The Facebook groups that have been created for Myra are by complete strangers who never met her, not her family. They also left Mississippi not knowing what happened to her shortly after her disappearance. Could you really pack up and just leave? I understand maybe they felt like after Myra's abduction, it was a dangerous place to bring up their other children. What was to stop them from going missing in the same area? But they didn't really try. They didn't speak to any local media regarding the case. They didn't put anything on social media for Myra. We're talking this was 2014. So therefore they had Facebook, they had Instagram, they had all these things at their disposal and yet none of them were used. They've done a couple of interviews and I mean I dove, like Tom Daly dove in and I still couldn't find much information. In the interviews that I did find of the family, they rang a little bit strange to me. I was, I was sitting there thinking, why? Why are you acting like a weirdo? I really don't want to believe that it's you. In one of the interviews, the family are in some sort of like play park. It just seems very forced. All the kids are running around and Erica's sitting there with like lots of children and she just looks bored to tears. You know, she doesn't even look upset. She doesn't cry. She doesn't say anything really about her daughter. The only time she perks up is when the conversation is brought to her and what she's like and how much she loves her husband. She doesn't really want to give them any information about her daughter. I mean, all you need to do is look at this photograph and tell me that she looks bored. She's snoozing. She's snoozing Susan and she doesn't want to be there. Another interview, which is like an excerpt from Stranger Things, it's just bizarre, is one I actually found on YouTube on a YouTube channel called Good Twin, Bad Twin. And the intro itself is like super campy. It's two twins and they're called something like Alvin and Calvin. And the intro is just so bizarre for the case. It's like, hi, I'm Alvin and I'm Calvin. And here today we're with the Lewis family. And it's Erica's demeanor. She looks like she's trying not to laugh and it's terrifying to watch. Not only this, her partner, she keeps looking over at her partner and it's as if there's some weird secret inside joke. My suspicions were also fueled by the fact that they only really talk about themselves in this interview. It's very odd. Alvin and Calvin, the hosts of this wonderful show, ask the family things about their childhood, how they met, because these are the only questions that the Lewis family will allow. Greg Lewis, who in other interviews has always seemed quite honest, quite down to earth, seems like he's totally in love with himself. He talks about his old glory days as an athlete and how he had around six to 12 colleges fighting for his attention. Not only that, he starts to say that he was quite a big deal in his town because he was such a star athlete and everybody knew him. Meanwhile, Erica's sitting next to him, just smiling. What's behind your smile, Erica? What's behind your smile? I just can't see that same fight and Erica that I've seen in several other mothers who've got missing children. Say for example, Reese Bonner's mum, she advocates every single day on TikTok, on Facebook, on social media, everywhere looking for answers to what happened to her son. Also, Madeleine McCann's parents, yes, whether you love them, you hate them, whatever, they were in the media every single day. They even wrote a book about her disappearance and these people have just gone completely off the radar as if we don't wanna find out what happened to her daughter, we're fine not knowing.
Obviously, when it comes to the mistrust within the police force, I totally understand that. I understand the Lewis family wanting to get as far away from the FBI and Camden Police as possible because look at what they did to their family. Their family was already in a really heartbreaking position and they ripped them to shreds. I get that, but I just can't understand why they don't do their own investigation and why they don't try on social media. The fact that the only Facebook pages that Myra has is from complete strangers strangers creating them. It just doesn't seem right to me. We're now sitting in 2021 and like the case of most missing black children, we are no further forward in the investigation. The Camden police do state that this case is not a cold case and it won't be because they will continue to work on it. But if it's not in the media and no one's really feeling the pressure to say anything or come forward, then what are we really meant to do? This little girl needs her story heard and I would ask all of you to share Myra's story. I will be placing a post on my Instagram page and if you could share that, that would be amazing. Even if you, you know, do your own research, screenshot a picture of Myra and share it to your Instagram and Facebook pages with her description. The police have released an age progressed photo of Myra and what she would look like round about now. Little Myra would be 10 years old now. There's a $20,000 reward for any information leading to finding Myra and if we all pull together maybe finally we could bring Myra home. What do you guys think about this week's case? I know it's a little bit of a controversial one. Did they do it? Didn't they? Was it a bobcat? Did the police do enough? Did they do the right thing by arresting Erica? And I think the kind of vote for that is unanimous. It's a no from me. What's your thoughts? Please put them in the comments box below. If you did like this week's episode, give it a big old thumbs up for me. If you're a first time watcher right now and you're thinking, hmm, she's not that much of a weirdo, I mean, kinda around the eyes a little bit crazy, then hit that subscribe button and I'll be here for you every Friday with our True Crime Killer Weekends and on and off every couple of Wednesdays with our Weirdo Wednesdays. If you want to see what I'm up to in my day-to-day, -day, everyday life, then please feel free to follow me, not to the local pub, that's not acceptable. On Instagram, at Megan True Crime, I also have a TikTok, a little bit of tick in the talk. That sounded like a really bad nursery rhyme. But anywho, at Megan.TrueCrime. I'm off to have some beans on toast because I'm absolutely starving. Please remember to lock your doors, don't talk to strangers, and please, if you have twins, don't rhyme their names. Bloody Alvin and Calvin. Jesus. See ya! What's a bit of a rumba now? Ooh. Okay, bye. <laughs>